this review has been long overdue. It's been, I think, exactly a year to the day, at least at the time of recording this uh, video, that Heaven's Feel was released in theaters, uh, at least here in the U.S. Uh, unfortunately, at the time last year, November 18th, uh, my theater, my local theater was canceled. The entire state of California actually had to cancel the showings for Heaven's Feel as well as other movies because of COVID related incidents and uh, you know the pandemic all that good stuff but uh, yeah I was able to watch it in theaters a couple months ago and uh, I'm finally doing a review why it took me this long I would explain but it's it's a bit convoluted so I'm just gonna say I finally had the time now so let's go ahead and get to this review but first things first I just want to say thank you to Yofo Table the studio responsible for giving us Phase Zero, Unlimited Blade Works, Heaven's Feel, all three movies. Because I feel like if it wasn't for, I, I feel like, I feel like I'm going to say feel a million times in this entire video. So take a shot every time I say feel. But anyways, if it wasn't for a uh, UFO table, I would have never gotten into the Fate series. And I feel like that's true for a lot of, uh, you know, fans, modern fans, casual fans, uh, newer fans, I should say. Because UFO table gave new life to the Fate series in a lot of ways. Because prior to UFO Table adapting Fate and really Kata no Kyokai in a way because that's their, you know, entry to the Nasuverse. Prior to that, Fate was, uh, to my understanding, still a pretty big name. Obviously not as big as it is today. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that UFO Table took it upon themselves to adapt Fate Zero. And then that was really big at the time. And then Unlimited Blade Works came out. That was really big and successful. And then, of course, Heaven's Field 3 is just... Or all three movies, I should say, was a big hit as well. So, again, thank you to UFO Table. You guys killed it. It seems like to me, and you guys could call me a conspiracy theorist, you know, wearing my aluminum helmet or whatever. But I, I have a feeling that this is their last uh, Fate-related work that they're ever going to, you know, adapt. I know a lot of people want to see the original Saber route, the original Fate route to be readapted because obviously we have the original anime but that one doesn't look as good it wasn't adapted or didn't get the respect i guess it deserves but i don't think yofo table from the sounds of it from their statements and from the way they advertise uh heaven's feel it looks like that this is their goodbye to the fate fans and notice how i said fate fans because i i think after they're done with uh demon slayer i think they will tackle sukihime that's my prediction I think so because they did Kano Kyokai. They did two out of the three original Fate routes. I don't think they're going to pick up the original Saber route. I don't think they're going to uh, do Hollow Atteration as much as I would want them to do that or any other Fate related stuff besides the cooking with Amina uh, stuff because I think UFO Table does that as well. But that's like a side spin off thing. I think their next plan of attack uh, as far as Nasuverse stuff would be Tsukihime just because Tsukihime just got its, you know, VN remake a couple months back. Melty Blood came out as well. So I think, in my opinion, it's best to strike while the iron is pretty hot right now and give us a Tsukihime, at least announcement, maybe sometime next year, maybe two years from now, once Demon Slayer is done and over with, they could finally focus on other things, on other projects as well. So I think that would be their best plan of attack. Uh, who knows? Maybe tomorrow they're going to announce, yeah, we're going to do uh, the Fate route with Saber as the main heroine. And I'm going to be like, oh, okay, that's cool. And I'll eat my words. But I, I think... I, I remember reading that this, you know, Heaven's Feel is their last, you know, thing that they're ever going to do with Fate. So I just want to say again, thank you, UFO Table. If it wasn't for you guys, I don't know if I would be here um, talking about Fate right now and playing it and repping the merch and all that stuff. So, yeah, again, thank you. Anyway, finally talking about the movie, I just want to say uh, this is going to be a very, well, maybe not very, but it is going to be a controversial, maybe polarizing opinion coming from me. I think... All right, I feel, all right, take another shot because I said feel for like the 20th time in this video. But I think that uh, Heaven's Feel 3, from a visual standpoint, from an animation standpoint, I want to say it is the best work that UFO Table has ever put out there in terms of visuals. Again, I have to keep prefacing that because I'm sure some people have their own different opinions in terms of story, in terms of characters, in terms of this, that, or the other. I'm just strictly talking about visuals, all right? 
Yes, and I'm sure upon saying that, I know some of you guys are already typing in your little keyboards and hitting that dislike button, saying that, wait a second, no it's not. Obviously, UFO Table's best work is their recent hit movie, Demon Slayer Mugen Train. And I gotta say, as somebody who's watched both movies multiple times, I think I actually watched Mugen Train more than I did Heaven's Field 3. And I, before I even get to the comparison in terms of the visuals, I will say this, Mugen Train is... Probably the more enjoyable of the two. It has a lot more funny moments. It has a lot uh, more, I guess, action in it. Minute one to the end, it's just a roller coaster of just craziness. Whereas Heaven's Field 3 is like up and down, up and down. There's like slow parts, there's quiet parts. And then, but when it get, hits those highs, it's really high. So I will say overall, Mugen Train's still probably the more enjoyable of the two. But visually speaking, I have to say, Heaven's Field 3 Spring Song. I think blows Mugen Train out of the water easily. I, I won't even say by just a marginal amount. I think it just easily destroys Mugen Train. No questions asked. And I understand the two have very different art styles and, uh, you know, animation quirks and whatnot, but they're both made by the same studio. Comparing the two is sort of inevitable, especially since I made that controversial statement a minute or two ago saying that Heaven's Field 3, in my opinion, is UFO Table's best work visually. So. I feel like the only one that is contending with Heaven's Field 3 at that point would be Mugen Train. And, and in my opinion, in terms of presentation, when I watch Heaven's Field 3 and then I watch Mugen Train and then I compare the two, Heaven's Field 3 is presented like a movie. It looks like a movie. It feels like a movie. Take another shot. Uh, whereas Mugen Train, and this might sound weird, but I'm going to try my best to explain this. Mugen Train feels like a longer episode. It doesn't feel like a movie. It's not presented like a movie. It just feels like a longer TV series episode. When I watch Mugen Train and then I compare it to its own TV series, there's not that much of an improvement, if at all an improvement. In fact, I would even go as far as saying that certain episodes of the TV series looks better, actually, than the Mugen Train movie. And I know that sounds very controversial, and I'm sorry that I'm you know, sticking to this topic and this comparison too long because this is supposed to be Evans Field 3 movie review, not on the Mugen Train one. But, you know, I just feel like I, I need to explain myself in, in somewhat detail. I think the animation just doesn't look like movie quality an animation. And I know that sounds very weird. UFO Table, everything they put out, whether it's a TV series or a spinoff or a full-blown movie, everything looks like a movie. But I don't know. Uh, when I watch anime movies, especially an anime movie that has a TV series attached to it, usually when you see the movie and then you compare it to its you know normal anime TV series, taking UFO Table out of it, just in general with anime movies, there is a clear improvement. It looks like it has a movie budget. But Mugen Train didn't. In some cases, it there are certain cases, certain scenes that just does not look good. I'm just going to say that straight up. I'm not going to go into detail just in case you've never seen it. To me, Heaven's Field 3 had the better movie quality visuals, whereas Mugen Train just looked like a longer episode. And it says a lot uh, too, because if you're caught up with the Demon Slayer TV series, then you know that the new season just came out a couple weeks ago. And literally the first seven episodes is just the movie Mugen Train cut up into seven parts. So the fact that they're willing to release the movie in seven separate parts or whatever, how many episodes it is, and implement it into the TV series just tells me that, yeah, it's it was basically made to be a longer episode at that point. Like uh, At least that's what it looks like to me. So yeah, I'm sure some people are going to disagree with me. I'm sure there's going to be a couple of dislikes, a couple of unsubscriptions, and a couple of people annoyed that I'm comparing the two movies really hard. Again, I'm just comparing them visually from everything else, like story-wise and, you know, enjoyment and whatever. That's totally other stuff. Like, we could sit here and have a little debate about that all day long. But in terms of just visuals, I think Heaven's Field 3 is like in the pinnacle of UFO table works, whereas Mugen Train is probably... Right there, right right under there, just, just second. I mean, Heaven's Field would be up there in the heavens, right? In the heavens, which makes sense with its name. And then Mugen Train would be down here where, where the trains would be. So, I don't know. That's just me. There's just like a nine-day difference. But if you disagree, whatever. Anyway, I think it goes without saying that I would give this movie, just like its previous two films, a 10 out of 10 in terms of animation. There's At no point was I like, oh, that looks kind of weird. Oh, that looks kind of disgusting. I guess you could make the argument with like Heracles is like, or Berserker's CGI form, but I think it kind of fits with the whole aesthetic of him being corrupted and like a, a total monster. It just fits to me, at least. 
Uh, I don't know if I'm just being biased at that point, but yeah, I would give this easily a 10 out of 10. It's a clear improvement from the previous two films. Obviously, it's an improvement from Unlimited Blade Works. I mean, that's not really a fair comparison since Unlimited Blade Works is like, what, four years old comparison to uh, compared to Heaven's Field. So probably not a fair comparison, but still, uh, you could see the progression of animation with Heaven, with the third movie compared to the previous two films. So yeah, easy 10 out of 10. I would even say an 11 out of 10. Ironically enough, I would say actually its biggest strength, this movie's biggest strength is definitely the music, the OST. Like when we think about the visuals of uh, modern fate anime, right? As, as a modern casual fan or a new fan, I shouldn't even say casual because I wouldn't consider myself casual, but I would consider myself a modern fan. As a modern fan, when I think about modern fate animation, of course, my, my brain auto automatically goes to UFO table. That's just a given. But when I think about Modern Fate music, Modern Fate soundtrack, of course, I got to think about Yuki Kajira. She's been producing the music for the UFO table Fate anime since since Fate Zero and has been around since Kata no Kyoka even further back. And she's been doing uh, anime music for a while now, not even just UFO table works. She's been killing it in, in a variety of different successful anime like Sword Art Online. I think she also does uh, Demon Slayers as well. So she's been killing it in, in the music industry as far as anime. And of course, this movie is no exception. I think her music in this particular movie, it carries the scenes like even more so than animation. I'm not even kidding. More so than the story, more so than the characters. I think this film's literal biggest strength is Yuki Kajura's OST. The music just carried like let's let's talk about one of my favorites right now Kotomine Kire versus Hassan or Assassin I should say and Zoken like that oh my goodness I'm like fanboying right now I'm not gonna lie because if you guys have been around on my channel for a while then you know that Kotomine Kire to me is one of the best characters in in fate in general like I think he's one of the most interesting he he is a sick bastard he is a sick bastard but that's what makes him entertaining that's what makes him interesting it, I think it's just I don't I'm no psychology expert or um you know major or anything I've only taken like one or two psychology classes in my day I think there's like something in regards to human nature when it comes to you know viewing characters that are psychopathic and heartless and just inhumane in a lot of ways like when i watch Kota Minikide, i'm like he's just so interesting he's so entertaining there's something about him despite how messed up and fucked up he is he's just so interesting i just want to sit down and and have a bowl of mapo tofu with him and, and pick his brain obviously i'd be scared shitless because this man might destroy me he might eviscerate me in fact he's such an interesting and and great character like when he's fighting a son they, they decide to give him a bit of a backstory which as somebody who's um, been a fan of the Fate series for a while. I already knew about this, but they they talk about his his uh, wife, his late wife who died, or I don't even know if it was his wife or just like a girlfriend or or lover, but it's somebody he he tried to love, tried to fall in love with because he he himself acknowledges that there's something messed up with him, that there's something wrong with him. So he attempted to, you know, love somebody else because he he's incap he feels incapable of love. So he tries to love this woman. And even goes as far as having a child with her. And unfortunately, this woman, uh, in an attempt to prove that Kotomine Kide did indeed love her, she decides to, and uh, this is a very touchy subject, but she decides to commit suicide in front of Kide, which does get an emotional response from Kide. And from her eyes, she's like, oh, see, you do love me. See, I killed myself. And the last thing I see is uh, you crying for me. So that's proof at least in my eyes, that you did indeed love me and, you know, you did fix yourself. But Kotomine Kide later reveals that, nah, I didn't cry because I loved you. I didn't mourn because I loved you and I'm saddened by your death necessarily. I'm sad because I couldn't do it myself. And I was just like, damn, Kotomine Kide is a freaking savage. And that's like the least savage thing he like did and portrayed himself to be in this movie because this man, and we knew how powerful he is if you've ever seen Zero. So Kide finds himself in a decrepit church, an abandoned, dilapidated church. I don't even know if I used dilapidated in the right um, setting there, but yeah, he finds himself in the church, ironically enough, and he's fighting Assassin. And of course, Assassin, lore-wise, is known to be the weakest heroic spirit, at least in general. In, in, in general, not in all cases, obviously, if it was like, you know, Grand Assassin Hassan, Kotomine Kide would get absolutely slapped. But anyway, he's holding his own against Hassan, which is surprising to see a human 
in general, be able to stand up against a heroic spirit. But of course, we all know that Kotomine Kide is no normal human. He's no normal slouch. This isn't his first time going against, you know, somebody who might be stronger than him. This isn't his first rodeo, you know what I'm saying? So he's able to keep up with Hassan. And at some point, Hassan uses his noble phantasm against Kide and it's like, oh shit, Kide's fucked. But he has a resistance against it. He's somehow able to counter the noble phantasm and, and live through it. And which is much to Hassan's surprise. And Hassan's like, wait, what? Like, I should have your heart in my hand. And then Kide pins him against the wall, ready to fuck his ass. He has his ass spread wide open. But no, Kide decides to go up the stairs and confront Zoken head on. Like, I was like, damn, he, he's not even going to take care of Hassan. He's going straight for the master. How did he know that Zoken was even on the roof? I don't know. I don't care. It was hype because, oh my, he went up to Zoken. Zoken barely had time to react. Zoken just turned around like, wait, what? And Kide grabbed him by the head. And then he was like, yo, you wanted Heaven's Feel, right? Yo, bitch ass wanted Heaven's Feel, right? I'm about to make you feel exactly what Heaven feels like. And a beam of light comes from the sky and this godly ass music plays. And then he starts to recite a Bible verse and Zoken starts disintegrating before your very eyes. And I'm just like, yo, this is freaking hyped. Again, the music carries it that godly holy church-like music as, as kide is reciting this bible verse and i'm just like yo kide is a freaking savage this he's such a good character he's so entertaining to watch so interesting ah uh, like i need him to be an fgo i need some iteration of kotimine to be in the game as a playable character because I, I I love him. He's he's my favorite character in in Heaven's Feel, hands down. Not even no questions asked. And funny enough, people who played the VN, as per usual, they always love to do this. But they said that the scene between him and Zoken was done better in the VN. And I did look it up. The fight is a lot longer. It's a, it's a bit more back and forth. But I think I actually prefer just Kide just grabbing him in the forehead and then just like eviscerating him here and there. I think to me that works a bit better because it just shows how powerful how much of a savage how easily kide counters um zogan I, I think it just works better for me but that's just me i'm sure i'm a little bit biased i'm sure you're a little bit biased let me know how you felt about uh kide versus zogan i think i think it was done as well as it could have been in the time slot it was given for this movie it was just oh so good i, I could rewatch that scene a million times and never never get tired of it i'm not even kidding speaking of scenes that i can watch a million times over and over again and that is carried by the music of Yuki Kajura. I, I, oh my goodness. The, the buildup to Berserker versus Emiyashiro. Not even the fight, the buildup. This is one of those rare cases where I think the buildup was amazing. A, a lot more hype than the actual fight. The actual fight was short, sweet, to the point, which makes sense. In a longer fight, Berserker would slap the shit out of Emiyashiro easily. 10 out of 10. No questions asked. Of course, Emi, I had to end the fight as fast as possible. It makes sense. I think I think it being short makes sense. I know some people were disappointed, but that's besides the point. The build-up, though. The build-up, though. The emotions. The epicness. The anticipation. The music, again. The music is what makes it. I, I'm sorry. The music is what carries this entire scene. Because you have Shiro and Ilya chilling. Not really chilling. They're, they're actually quite scared and nervous. And the anxiety is an all-time high inside of a ditch because berserker is going off looking for Ilya in the in the forest Ilya's is like no shiro you can't do this you can't use uh archer's arm if you do there's no turning back there's no going back and shiro's like nah it's my job as a brother to protect you i got you fam and then this emotional music plays in the background and then Ilya's like all right you got to do what you got to do shiro gets up takes off his jacket rips off the sleeve and shiro gets out of the ditch and then all of a sudden we're in like in this dream like world or state where we see Shira running through like some kind of vortex or some kind of storm in a wasteland. He's fully nude. We could see his abs, his muscles, everything. And he's struggling to then in the distance through all the dust, all the debris, everything. We see Archer standing there back against Shira, right? Archer turns around and is like, yo, can you keep up, bitch? Can you keep up? And this scene absolutely means Jack shit to you if you've never seen unlimited blade works if you've never read the vn for unlimited blade works this scene means nothing to you but if anybody any any viewer did see unlimited blade works and was invested in the dynamic between archer and shiro 
then this scene is absolutely hype. I don't care if you like the man. I don't care if you dislike the man. I don't care if you love the man. I don't care if you want to choke him out with your bare fist. I don't care. I don't care. I, I'm one of those people. I'm indifferent about Shira overall. But you have to admit one thing. His theme song, when, when, once it starts picking up, Shiro starts breaking through the mold and starts running faster and runs past Archer. Oh, I can't. I'm not getting hyped about it right now. I'm getting goosebumps. Every time I see that scene, that build up, I get goosebumps. I get, I get shivers down my spine. It's one of the best build ups to a fight. Like the fight itself, it's okay. It's whatever. It's cool. It's hype. It, it is what it is. But the build up is what makes it insanely good. It, the music, I, I mean, when we think about Shiro, when we think about Emiya, when we think about Archer, we think about oh, Unlimited Blade Works. He, does, he has a shit ton of swords. He has a shit ton of blades, whatever. It's called Unlimited Blade Works for a reason. And we may also think about how many women he has flocking towards him, trying to get that duck. Another thing we also think about, probably more so than any of that, is the amount of remixes this man has for his theme. The Emiya theme, top 10. It's in the top 10 best theme songs in, in anything, in, in any entertainment media. I don't care if we're talking about anime, uh, visual novels, anything, any entertainment, fictional media. His, his theme has to be up there in the top 10. I don't care what anyone says. Any iteration of it, whether we're talking about Murmasa's theme, Unlimited Blade Works, Heaven's Feel, whatever it is, his theme is oh, so freaking good. So good. So good. I'm, I'm about to rewatch it right now after this video. I'm not even going to lie. It's so good. But yes, as you can see, it's another instance where Yuki Kajuda's music just, just kills it. Just makes the scene that much better. Just brings it to the next freaking level. But if we're talking about fights, fights that blew the roof off, right? of the theater or of your own house. I don't care where you were. If there was a roof above your head, it got blown away. And if there was no roof above your head, it doesn't matter. A roof spawned above your head and was blown away because this fight scene between Ryder and Saber Alter, I, I'm not even gonna, this is another controversial statement. I'm sure many of you will disagree and I don't really give a fuck if you disagree with this or not. This to me is among the best of the best in terms of anime fight scenes. I'm not even kidding. Call me biased. You call me this. You could call me that. I have not seen every anime fight scene known to man. So of course, I don't know if there's a better fight scene out there. But I could say this with confidence. It's definitely one of the best anime fight scenes I've ever seen in my life. It's in the pinnacle up there. It's up there somewhere with a bunch of other anime fight scenes, whatever. I'm not saying it's better than everything else. I'm just saying it's among the best because visually speaking, the fight choreography and again, the music. Perfect. Perfect. No complaints at all about the the orgasmic, beautiful <laughs> fight that they had. I, I don't. I, I can't even describe it in words. It's it's impossible. It's impossible to describe how great, how hyped this fight scene was because it took everything. If you watch my uh, review of the second movie when I talked about uh, Berserker versus Saber Alter, the reason why I love that fight so much is because it was all business. There was no bullshit monologues there was no drawn out you know exchanges of talking shit there was no flashbacks about uh friendship uh that lasted for three minutes and then somebody does an ass pull and then somebody wins no this is a straight up brawl just like berserker versus saber altar yes there is some dialogue between uh rider and saber altar they sort of talk shit here and there but it makes sense within the story because rider is trying to take attention off of shiro by taunting Saber Alter, so it makes sense from the story standpoint since uh, Shiro is a huge part of their plan to defeat Saber Alter. Uh, so that dialogue, I had no problem with it. And the small flashback we did have uh, during the fight made sense as well because they talked about the plan and then everything sort of makes sense from there. It's like, oh shit, here comes the plan. Shiro jumps in, deploys Roias as, as Saber is ready to launch Excalibur and then Ryder is preparing to launch her own Noble Phantasm. And just seeing those three at the same time going off, it's, it's so hype. Like seeing Noble Phantasms go off is always hype. But then seeing pretty much two of them at the same time, I, don't, I think Row Eyes is considered Noble Phantasm, so I'll say three. So yeah, seeing three of them go off pretty much at the same time is mind-blowing. One of the best anime fights I've ever seen. Like it, The fact that Ryder was portrayed previously in the first film, she got mollywhopped. She got destroyed. She got her ass eaten by Saber. Easily in the alleyway, 
she she looked really weak in that movie. And if you have seen Unlimited Blade Works and you know what happens to Ryder there, she looked really weak there too. So for a lot of um, portrayals of Ryder, she is portrayed as extremely, extremely weak, which we know as fans, that's not the case. She's actually one of the more powerful servants in, in the fate routes. It's just that she is limited by uh, Shinji and of course by the plot itself, but uh, that's besides the point. In this particular case, she doesn't have that limitation anymore. She is free to go off. And then you have Saber, an altered version of herself, who's able to go off even more because she could spam Excalibur like nobody's business. Granted, I think it's uh, Excalibur Morgan is considered weaker than normal Excalibur. But still, the fact that she's able to spam it is is amazing because Ryder is able to somehow keep up, at least for a couple of minutes, until uh, she needs uh, Shiro's help. So... That entire sequence, when, when the music gets more and more intense, when they're deploying their noble phantasm, that to me is just great. That, the, the entire score, the entire OST for that particular scene went so well with, with what was going on. It almost looked like like, like a concert even. <laughs> like It was choreographed to the music. Like the, the song was made specifically for that scene, which might sound, you know, like, oh, no shit, Sherlock. But like when we watch anime, a lot of times they reuse the same OST for different fight scenes for different uh, things that happen throughout the anime. In this case, for Heaven's Feel, we rarely hear the same song played over and over again. Only songs I could think of that was played over and over again is like the emotional songs that play during soccer scenes. That's played pretty um, uh, repetitively, but not to the point where it got annoying. But for the most part, or pretty much uh, for every other scene, had its own soundtrack made specifically for that part. So when I hear that song, I just think about that scene. I don't think about a bajillion other scenes like I would with other OSTs out there. Easily one of the best anime fight scenes and um, might be the best anime fight scene visually that we've seen from a Fate animated work. Obviously if they animate more Fate stuff in the future that may change but I think not too many people could disagree with me when I say that it's, it's one of the best visually speaking out there in terms of Fate, in terms of anime in general. It, it just is. Now, while all that is going on, while Ryder and Saber Alter are producing the best anime fight scene or one of the best of all time, Rin confronts Sakura. 1v1, sister to sister, mano y mano, all cards are on the table, literally, and these two are about to duke it out as well. Now, let, let me talk about the storytelling of this film for a second, the way it's paced, the way everything is uh, spread out, because in the beginning, we see Dark Sakura uh, try to take Ilya from uh, Shira's home. And then, of course, Rin comes out and it's like, no, you can't do that. Like, snap out of it, etc., etc., etc. And she tries to fight Sakura. She tries to defend herself. But, of course, with no prep time, no planning, no strategy, just nothing but her jewels and her gems to defend her, Rin gets absolutely destroyed. Easily. Easily destroyed by Sakura. It's not even a contest. It's not even a fight. It's just it's just a slaughter. And then fast forward towards the end of the movie where they have their little rematch. Now, this time, Rin did have prep time. This time, she did have time to strategize. This time, she had time to prepare her resources. The outcome is totally different. It's a back and forth. Dark Sakura is all confident. Not even confident. I wouldn't even say that. I would say she's arrogant. I think even Rin calls her arrogant as well. She's arrogant. She's cocky. She has almost like a Gilmesh feel to her where she's she knows she could easily win if she goes full out. And she's smiling, looking down on Rin. And Rin, on the other hand, despite what happened to her earlier in the film, is actually confident. She's nonchalant. She's stoic. She's confident, which is different from Akra's arrogance. And we're like, okay, why is she confident? Why does she look like she could actually win this? I actually believe that she could win this, but how is she going to do it? And she pulls out the jeweled sword of Zelretch, which, goddamn, <laughs> she embarrasses Sakura at this moment because you got to put things into perspective, really. Sakura had 10 years, 10 years of torture to suffer through, 10 years of mental, physical strain to get to this point of power, to get to this point of having this much magical energy to the point she's able to destroy servants left and right easily and written. Only had one, pretty much one day, I, I'm pretty sure, like one day or one night to prepare, to strategize. And she whips out just the, <laughs> one of the most broken things we've seen so far <laughs> in this series, the Jeweled Sword of Zelrich. Like, 
she's able to counter everything Sakura throws at her. She Sakura throws the big shadows, counter. Throws a bunch of little bunnies and little animals to blow up in front of Rin, counter. Destroyed easily. Rin is able to counter it and Sakura is like, what? Why? Like, this is unfair. This is, this is BS. And I have mixed feelings about this because in one hand, I'm like, holy crap, Rin is... She's crazy. She is a freaking savage. Like in a lot of ways, and some people may disagree, some people may agree, but hear me out. In a lot of ways, she's kind of like the Batman of the series. And you might be like, no, the Batman of the series is easily Kitatsugi. The Batman of the series is obviously this or that. But you got to think about it like this. If you have ever seen like a Batman versus insert character here, insert OP character here, any thread on Reddit or, or any other online uh, website, a lot of the times people say, well, if you give Batman prep time, he could beat anyone. He could beat Goku. He could beat Superman. He could beat One Punch Man. He could beat this and that as long he has prep time. And to me, that is what Rin is in this situation. Because at the beginning of this movie, like I said, she gets destroyed. She had no time to prep, no time to strategize, nothing. She is then given one day of preparation and counter Sakura's every single move she does. Just easily, confidently, nonchalantly, stoically, just is able to, to counter everything Sakura brings out. That just shows how much of a strategist, how experienced, how smart Rin actually is. Like when we look at Rin, like we know she's a skilled combatant. We know she's a, an above average mage in terms of magical circuits, in terms of actual spells she could use, etc., etc. But if you give her prep time, she is a force to be reckoned with. Granted, yes, she needed the help of Ilya. She needed the help of Shiro to project uh, the jeweled sword but still like i assume it was her plan i mean maybe Ilya had something to do with it as well but i assume a lot of it had to do with her intellect and her strategizing so she she makes every master look look weak <laughs> like i'm not even kidding maybe maybe bar uh kiritsugu maybe bar him maybe bar uh kotomini Kiri. but other than them maybe um she's she's just absolutely crazy like you give her prep time you you might as well just lose like I believe that as long as you give her prep time, she could beat anyone. She's on some Batman level shit in, in that regard. So sorry, Sakura, you got absolutely embarrassed. You got absolutely slapped. And I, I like that a little bit after they show a scene where it was a flashback when they were children, when uh, Sakura and Rin were playing some kind of card game and Sakura thought she won. She lays down her cards on the table or on the floor. And she smiles. She's like, yeah, I got this. You, you know, I, 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 I won, sister. I, I actually finally won something against you. Can I get acknowledged? Can I get some head pats? Can I uh, get a compliment something? And then you see Rin's face. She looks at her cards and she just absolutely has the most broken hand on some Exodia level shit. Don't, don't give Rin time to prepare. Don't give her uh, time to prep and strategize. Because if you do, then, then you're most likely going to lose. That's just how it is. So shout out to Rin. You, you, to me, you're the Batman of the series. I don't care what anyone says. I mean, you're both rich. You're both orphans in a way. You're both uh, trained in the art of uh, martial arts. Like, they, they're actually a lot more similar than I thought. But I'm sure some people will disagree and still say Kitatsugi. But to me, I think Rin has has the brains that could... Uh, actually, you know what? Let's let's go sell this in the comments. Who would win? Batman or, or Rin? If they both had prep time. Let's think about this for a sec. I, I'm sure most of you guys would say Batman, but that's besides the point. Let's stop talking about Batman. Let's get let's go back to fate. Now, let's talk about the reason why I had mixed feelings about this scene. Because again, on one hand, I like the fact that it sort of does a callback to the beginning of the film. The storytelling is really nice, the foreshadowing, etc. 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 But I remember for the past couple of years, the reason why a lot of people don't like Sakura is because they feel like she's a Mary Sue type character. If you don't know what a Mary Sue type character is, I'm going to try my best to explain it. Or you could just Google it and find a better definition. But according to what I've seen online and explanations given by other people, a Mary Sue type character in fiction is basically a female character who is portrayed as damn near perfect, without flaws, to the point that the world around them is sort of manipulated in their favor. And a lot of people like to say Sakura is a Mary Sue character, which I could see the argument here and there for that. But I think in this scene, at least to me, I feel like in a lot of ways, Rin is actually the Mary Sue type character in, in this series. And I know a lot of people will get mad when I say that, but I feel like it's true in almost every 
iteration of Rin that we've seen. Maybe Bar Ishtar, but you can make the argument with her. Um, if we're just talking about uh, Rin Tosaka, Tosaka Rin, even on Unlimited Blade Works, she is damn near perfect in terms of the strategy, in terms of being able to win, being able to pull out the ultimate weapon against whatever enemy she has. In, in this instance, especially, like she literally only had one day of prep. And she's able to counter 10 years worth of of magical energy and malice from Sakura, which to me, I'm just like, damn, this this woman is perfect in, in every way possible in terms of looks, in terms of, of story. Like she's important in every route. She's everyone's favorite character or a favorite girl or at least most people's favorite girl. She's the most skilled. She's rich. Again, she has a look. She's popular in school. Every time it looks like she's about to die or something, she doesn't like... I feel like, and again, you guys could disagree with me. I don't think Sakura is the Mary Sue in this situation. I really think it's Rin. So that's why I have mixed feelings about it because all these years I've been told that, yeah, Sakura is a Mary Sue. I hate her. I hate her. I hate her. But I didn't get that impression from this at all. I, I mean, in some ways, yeah, she is because the world is manipulated in a way to benefit her because in the end of the day, she doesn't die. Nothing uh, bad happens to her at the end of the day, despite all the bad actions she's done. But you can make the same argument for Rin. She literally just slaps the shit out of Sakura. And even though she gets stabbed later, um, she's obviously fine by the end of the film. So I don't know. Um, I guess they're both Mary Sue's. I mean, they're both sisters. So I guess it runs in the family or something. I mean, not really. Their mom got absolutely traumatized and their dad obviously didn't. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to spoil Fate Zero for you guys, for those of you guys who have never seen it or read it. After the confrontation between Rin and Sakura, Shiro pops up. And to me, and some people may disagree because uh, a little bit after the scene towards the end of the movie, another powerful emotional moment does happen. There is another powerful and emotional scene. But to me, this is the most emotional scene in the entire uh, trilogy where Shiro confronts Sakura and Sakura's like, no, stay back. It's too late for me. Whatever. I, I, I There's no saving me at this point. Uh, you can't protect me. Like, save yourself. Uh, I killed my sister. Blah, 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 blah. And then Shiro's like, no. I promise I'll protect you. I promise I'll save you. Like, I, I will get you out of this situation. And as somebody who's um, never read the, the VN or read it fully, I should say, I had no idea how Shiro was going to save Sakura at this moment. So... When the music was building up, again, the music just builds up the scene, builds up the emotion, builds up the uh, tension, the epicness, the anticipation. When when it shows Shiro extending his arm, his, his archer arm, and he's about to project something. I'm like, what is he about to do? What is he about to summon? And, and then it shows Rule Breaker. And I'm like, oh shit, that makes so much sense. Obviously, as a Fate fan, I probably should have known that he was going to project Rule Breaker. But the fact that I didn't think about that just shows how good storytelling is at least to me how unpredictable it is and how much it makes sense even because again if you've never seen the limited blade works then you don't know much about rule breaker i guess or if you weren't paying attention to rule breaker at the uh in the first movie where uh, archer explains what it does this, this scene means nothing to you like you, you probably were, were like huh this is kind of an asshole but it isn't it makes sense for uh shiro to project rule breaker because it has the ability to nullify uh, all forms of Magecraft as well as cut contracts and cut ties um, in terms of uh, Magecraft related things which makes sense because Sakura is very much trapped and being manipulated by the Holy Grail by Angra mind you and uh, the only way to save her to separate her from the, the darkness the shadow from Angra mind you is to use Rule Breaker so when it was summoned and then the music gets more intense and emotional and then shows Sakura crying and then welcoming Shiro and then you see all the the black shadow tentacles going after Shiro as he's running about to stab uh, Sakura rule breaker I don't know that that entire build up to me uh, especially as the um, as the final film of the trilogy it, everything comes into a head there because since the first movie Shiro has been making this promise to Sakura like I will protect you I will save you I promise like uh, we will be together whatever it may be and we finally see how he's able to do it. And to me, it works. I like the emotion. I don't know why people hate the relationship between Sakura and Shiro. I, I actually really like it. I think, again, people are going to disagree with me, but it's okay. Whatever. I don't care. I think their romance felt a lot more, I guess, developed than even 
Shiro and Rin in Unlimited Blayworks. Uh, I can't speak too much about uh, Shiro and Saber per se in the uh, Fate route, but I want to say that the romance between Shiro and Sakura makes so much sense to me and you know i feel for it and i don't know if it's because i have a girlfriend too and if she was in that situation i would i would hope i would do what i would uh need to do to save her from whatever it may be but yeah so i felt for them and i was really happy for them i didn't cry or anything or i didn't shed a tear but i definitely felt emotional seeing him summon rule breaker and i was just like yes save your girl save her please and yeah uh, i was just so happy to see that i guess i guess that's uh, the best word i could use i was happy i was emotional uh, to finally see Sakura get saved after three movies of her getting tortured and uh, 10 years of her getting even more tortured than uh, was portrayed in the movie. So yeah, that was the most powerful emotional scene. And I know a lot of you guys will disagree because a little bit later, um, well, we're going to get to there um, eventually, but a little bit later, there's another uh, a very powerful emotional scene that is just there. I, I would say uh, Shiro saving Sakura is up there and then this next scene is like right below like barely barely marginal and i can see why people want an Ilya route based on uh that scene but anyway after um shiro saves sakura and then rider you know brings sakura's unconscious body and Rin's unconscious body as well out of the uh, caverns shiro goes up to presumably deal with anger mind you the big ass grail monstrosity and then up there we see kotamine kire and it's like oh shit he ain't dead because earlier in the film, it's shown that Sakura, you know, bodies him after he bodies Zoken. But obviously he's alive at this point, but he's definitely weak and definitely not at 100% power. He's old, he's decrepit, he's injured, but he's still buff as fuck. When he was taking out his jacket, I was like, yo, this man, this man did not skip gym at all and these two do get out of course they do because they have differing polarizing opposite end of the spectrum morals and goals it's a fist fight it's um a very grounded fight compared to what we just saw with rider versus saber altar rin versus a dark soccer this is a very grounded fight because it's just two men at their wits end they, they are both very weak and very injured bloodied up bruised battered and all they have is their will to fight and they just start punching and wailing each other and the, and the music here of course again i'm sorry if i sound like a broken record but it's true the music carries the scene but of course shiro wins and again this is this is one of the reasons why kotamine kide is a very very interesting character because he sort of accepts his defeat and even respects uh shiro as the the last master of the holy grail war and he dies with a smile on his face i'm pretty sure he had a smile on his face so again very interesting character because when we see a villain typically in anime get defeated they will grovel in pain they will uh, curse out the main character they will sometimes even beg for mercy but in this case no he kotominikide sort of accepts his defeat congratulates shiro and dies with a smile on his face and i i can't help but respect that i can't help but he's a despicable man disturbed psychopath but i respect the grind because he's he's buff as fuck and hot as shit but i also respect his mindset like when he knows he's being defeated he's like all right you know what respect to you shiro i hate you i i wanted to win but you know what you were the better man at this situation you were the faster stronger man in this situation so i congratulate you yoroko be shonen so rest in peace kotomini kira you are a sick fuck but i respect you man like absolute savage a round of applause to the homie Kotominikide, like best character in the movie, hands down. Finally, we're at the end of the movie where Shiro, he has used uh, Archer's arm more times than he probably should have. He could barely talk, he could barely walk, he could barely move. He is ready to die pretty much at this moment in the film. I am aware that in the V end, there's uh, multiple endings to this. Uh, one of them being the one we got for the movie and the other one being that he actually projects Excalibur and uses Excalibur to destroy the Grail, very similar to what Saber does in Unlimited Blade Works, very similar to what she did in Zero. So in that sense, it would have been poetic. It would have been uh, very cool to see uh, Shiro uh, using Excalibur in, in an anime, in an anime adaptation. But what happens instead is the other ending, the other possible ending where Ilya actually pops up before Shiro even thinks about using Excalibur. And Ilya is able to uh, cancel out the holy grail since she herself is a holy grail essentially sacrifice herself to um get rid of the other holy grail and 
Uh, Shiro was like, no, don't do it. He could barely talk. He could barely even remember her name. Like you could tell that he's not all there uh, for the past like 20 minutes. Like he, he's just not all there. He could, he could barely do anything. And then Ilya asks the ultimate questions. Do you want to live? Do you want to stay alive? Do you want to remain here? And of course, Shiro, deep down inside, he admits that, yes, I do want to live. I don't want to die. Of course, this means that Ilya is like, all right, well, your wish has been granted. I will go uh, sacrifice myself and uh, get rid of the Holy Grail. And of course, Shiro's like, no, Ilya. And he continues to say Ilya. And again, this is a very emotional part. And I could understand, again, why people want to see an Ilya route. Because we want to see her character be fleshed out and see a route where she has a happy ending and yes you could argue well the prisma Ilya series exists <laughs> that's technically not a, a main story route but yeah um it would be nice to see uh Ilya route but unfortunately i don't think that's ever gonna happen uh but yeah so she dies she reunites with Irie, her mom which was very nice to see i think that's actually a decent ending for her obviously we want to see her alive but to see her reunite with her mom is just very emotional, especially if you've seen Fate Zero and you understand how much, you know, they loved each other. Uh, the Grail gets destroyed, the cavern falls apart, and Shiro seemingly dies. Like, he seemingly is uh, dies, but uh, thanks to the power of Heaven's Field, the Holy Grail, thanks to Ilya. Um, what happens here is sort of kind of weird because they don't really explicitly explain it. it only uh, hardcore Fate fans and people who have been paying very close attention to Every single word that has been said throughout all three films will understand what happened. But essentially what happened, Ilya made it so because Shiro's body is uh, destroyed and decrepit and damaged to the point of there's, there's no fixing it. The damage has been done. So what she did was she used Heaven's Field, which is a materialization of the soul, to materialize uh, Shiro's soul and made it so eventually, and it doesn't show it, but at some point uh, Rin and Sakura get a hold of his soul and are able to transport it or transfer it to a artificial body. And I know this is a lot to take in. It's like, wait, what? That did happen? And yes, for those of you guys who have seen Kata no Kyokai, uh, Garden of Sinners, which is another Nasuverse work, then you might have spot a, a familiar character, but there's a character there who appears in the end of Heaven's Feel 3 who specializes in puppet magic, I guess, uh, doll magic, and she's able to uh, presumably provide them with an artificial body for Shiro to inhabit. And that's how Shiro continues on living. I don't know how that's going to work in terms of the bedroom. I assume he could still use uh, some level of magecraft because uh, the character in Kata no Kikai is able to do that with a prosthetic body as well. Uh, I'm not going to spoil too much. If you haven't seen Garden of Sinners, I recommend it. It's a great, great series. Uh, very good storytelling. Uh, and again, it's it's made by Yoho Table as well. So visually speaking, it looks good as well. But yeah, so that's pretty much the ending. Uh, they live happily ever after. Everyone's cool. Everyone's great. Everyone's alive. Bar Ilya and of course Shinji and you know all the characters that did die. Uh, but yes, I I like the ending. I, uh, would it have been cool to see Shiro um, summon Excalibur? Yeah, would have been awesome. But I think for what we got, I think it was actually a pretty good ending. I liked it. Um, it was bittersweet. Uh, I know some people wanted Sakura to die at the end to pay uh, for what she's done. But I think after three movies of Shiro promising to save Sakura, I think it would be silly for either of them to die. I think it would be kind of stupid, um, to be honest, if either of them to die. Like three movies of investing into their relationship and wanting to see those two get together. I, I know some of you guys don't care about them getting together, but I did. I, I wanted to see them have a somewhat happy ending and I, that's what I got. So I'm 100% satisfied with that. I guess I would have wanted to see Sakura have some kind of punishment because she did kill a shit ton of innocent people. Not even talking about uh, the servants she did slaughter. Not even talking about Gilgamesh. And you guys know how much I love Gilgamesh. Not even talking about those characters. But just the dozens and dozens of people she killed uh, throughout Fuyuki City. Yeah, she should probably get some kind of punishment. I mean, she does have to live with that guilt. So you could say, oh, she that's enough punishment for her. But I think what would have been an acceptable ending would have been after they got uh, Shiro his body basically Sakura, Rin, and Shiro are on the run because the Mages Association want to um, and this, this is just me you know fan fiction headcanon type stuff uh, if uh, an acceptable ending would be the Mages Association wants to get 
a hand of Sakura's body to either experiment with her or punish her for her sins or maybe even kill her. So of course, uh, Rin and Shiro aren't about that life. So maybe what would have been a pretty interesting ending if it if it's um, literally those three on the run for the rest of their lives. I think that's pretty messed up ending, but at the same time, uh, we, we could be hopeful that those two will protect Sakura with all their lives. And uh, I think that would have been somewhat an, of an acceptable, I guess, quote unquote, punishment. Because now Sakura can't even live a normal life, I guess. But at the same time, she's with her sister and with the man of her life. So again, that would have been, I guess, somewhat of an acceptable ending. But at the same time, just seeing Sakura live a normal life after all the hell she's been through, along with Shiro and along with her sister... Uh, seeing them all happy together. I think I think that was a beautiful ending. And you guys could disagree. I really don't care. So in the end of the day, I'll give the animation, of course, as I said, 10 out of 10 easily. The music, again, carried everything. I would give that bitch probably like an 11 out of 10. The music carried everything. Uh, best part of this film for me. The story overall, because I have to say overall, not just the movie itself. I have to say overall, I think the story, I'd give it like an 8. The reason I don't give it a 9 or a 10 is because I think overall, I think Unlimited Blade Works still had the better storytelling. I think it just works better going off of Zero. I think Unlimited Blade Works just feels like the more canon of uh, between the two routes. Can't speak too much about the Fate route, but at least between Heaven's Feel and Unlimited Blade Works, I think Blade Works uh, just had the stronger story between the two. I think the romance was better done in Heaven's Feel, but the overall story and the dynamic between Archer and and Shiro and uh, all that stuff. I think Unlimited Blade Works did it better. Uh, so I would give Unlimited Blade Works, if you guys are curious, probably like a 9, maybe even a 9.5. I'm not going to lie. It, it, to me, it was really good. Then I would give Zero like a 10 because Zero is just amazing, in, in my opinion. But that's what I would give the story, an 8, probably an 8. Characters, I would give the characters, because I love Kota Minikita, the way he's portrayed in Heaven's Feel. And uh, based on my previous... Um, reviews you guys know that i absolutely love the way they portrayed shiro actually i actually like shiro a lot in heaven's field just the fact that he's able to throw away his morals and betray his morals in favor of the woman he loves i think that's just so endearing and so respectable that yeah i'll give the characters probably like a probably like an eight as well uh just because um there's certain characters here and there kind of like rin i think rin's kind of too too op that uh, it's just sort of unbelievable how OP she could be on some Batman level intellect strategizing. So yeah, probably like an eight. Enjoyment, I would say a nine. I'm sure that's surprising because uh, there's a lot of scenes here that is, it's, I would give this enjoyment a 10 out of 10, but if I were to be objective, definitely a nine, just because there are some slow parts in this movie, especially if you're a casual fan or fan that hasn't been around uh, Nasuverse or Fate stuff before. There's certain parts like when uh, Ilya talks about Angra Manu, um, Th that part, yeah, it is slow. To me, it's interesting, and I like that part. But for casual fans, I could see that being sort of jarring after seeing the Kotomine Kide versus Zoken fight, and then after that, the uh, Shiro versus Berserker fight, and then literally after that, you get this whole monologue about Angra Banyu for like two minutes or three minutes straight, and then they summon the Jewel Sword of Zelrits. Again, if you don't know anything about the Fate verse, or and this is your first time dipping your toes into it, these scenes mean nothing to you. For me, I love them, but objectively speaking, they were very slow parts of the movie and could be confusing to casual fans. So that's why I give the enjoyment level like a 9 out of 10. As for overall, I would give the movie, I think the second movie to me, I don't know. The second movie, I was going to say the second movie is probably better than the third movie, but they're, they're probably equal. The first movie is obviously the weakest of the three. Yeah, I'd probably give the... The overall movie probably like a I want to say nine I want to say nine but maybe that's too high I'd say 8.5 to a nine I'll say that 8.5 to a nine so it was a really strong movie great way to end the trilogy in my opinion animation was of course a one all that stuff I already talked about it probably my only thing should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about story but the only thing that I found kind of I wouldn't call this a plot hole maybe an oversight um, it would be a better word, but when Ryder and Saber Altar were about to duke it out, or I shouldn't even say that, uh, even beforehand, when it showed uh, Rin, Shiro, and Ryder go down the cavern and are confronted by Saber Altar, we see before Saber Altar tells Rin to go ahead and confront Sakura by herself, 
we see that Rin was ready to pull out the jewel sword of Zelrich at that very moment. Uh, presumably, she was going to fight alongside Ryder and alongside Shiro against Saber Altar. Presumably, uh, based on that little tidbit alone. Maybe the VN's different. You guys let me know. So to me, that's just kind of weird, especially with what happens later on. Because let's be honest, if Rin was part of the fight, just this fact that Ryder was able to keep up with Saber Altar for a couple of minutes, uh, toe to toe, just tells me that if Rin was part of the fight, uh, Saber Altar would have got blown back easily. At least in my opinion, she would have got blown back. So what makes that kind of weird is because later on in the fight between them, and I talked about this earlier, there's a flashback that shows Ryder and Shiro strategizing. And it's implied that Shiro uh, tells Ryder that, yeah, uh, what if I use Ro Ayas and shield you while you charge your Noble Phantasm and then we get Saber Altar like that. And it's just kind of weird that they had that planned because wouldn't Rin be part of that planning as well? Wouldn't she be part of that strategy? Because presumably she was supposed to be part of the fight um, based on the fact she was about to pull out the Jeweled Sword. But then all of a sudden... She's not part of the fight, so doesn't that mess up Shiro and Ryder's overall plan? I don't know. They didn't really delve into that. Uh, they did, Rin wasn't part of that flashback, so I don't know if Shiro anticipated Rin not being part of the fight, or maybe Shiro uh, from the beginning was, wasn't planning on Rin participating because he wanted to protect her or something. I don't know. Uh, I hope it, if I make sense, it just seems like kind of like an oversight because what was the point of planning that out if uh, the original, you know, fight was going to be Rin being part of it? And then with the Jeweled Sword, they would have blown back Saber Altar, presumably. I don't know, maybe in the VN, there's a there's an ending where Rin decides to stay and then she gets absolutely eviscerated and, and uh, destroyed despite the Jeweled Sword. But I don't know, just seems a little bit of an oversight. So I'm sure somebody will be able to... Uh, shed light on that maybe maybe the vn explains it better but yeah give this movie like an 8.5 maybe 9 because I, I love this movie I, I watched it multiple times and i'll continue watching it multiple times in the future and best scenes kote minikide zoken uh, berserker and emia rider versus saber altar one of the best anime fight scenes in my opinion and to me the more emotional part at least to me because this is soccer's route so i gotta be a little bit biased towards her the most emotional part of this movie is 100 percent definitely in my opinion, uh, when Shiro summons a rule breaker and there's, there's finally hope for Sakura. So yeah, 9 out of 10. I'm sorry if I was all over the place. Originally, this video was supposed to be full of animations and fancy shit, but I'm just speaking off the cuff. There's no uh, script or anything beforehand. I didn't rehearse this. So if it seems all over the place, then that's because it is. But yeah, enjoyed this movie. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Did you like this movie? Did you dislike it? What parts of the VN is a lot better than the movie? What parts did they cut out from the movie? All that good stuff. Let me know. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of negative comments disagreeing with me in terms of what I thought was the most emotional scene, what I thought about uh, Rin being a Mary Sue and Demon Slayer and all that stuff, you know. All that, all that stuff is definitely going to be very polarizing in the comments. I'm going to enjoy reading the comments section for sure. Hopefully people will watch this video. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, comment down below. Let me know what you think. Like the video if you like it. Dislike it if you dislike it. And of course, subscribe to become a supporting character to me, the main character. Because without you guys, I'd be the only character. And that would absolutely suck. See you guys in the next one, whatever that'll be. Yeah. Uh, bye bye. Thank you for watching.